I didn't know where I'd be here or not a few weeks ago, but um, we had a great time at the conference, hadn't we? And, and um, so many of the speakers were talking about just be prepared because the enemy doesn't like what's happening. And uh, the very next day was when I had the terrible fall and uh, put me back years, humanly speaking, but I thank God I'm here. <laughs> I'm back driving again this, this past week. I couldn't drive very far and I was driving a wee bit more yesterday, so I'm beginning to improve again. <laughs> uh, just need, I just need some more help yet, but it'll come. And um, uh, Judy, you have just such a ministry in reading, corporate reading. And uh, whether it's the Word or whether it's that beautiful story you told this morning, you don't just read from your lips, you read from your heart. And it shows, it's evident. Uh, and just thank you for that, it's precious. And the title of uh, my message this morning is, What Do You Do When You're Running On Empty? And I'm sure all of us at one time or another, if we're honest, we felt we were running on empty <laughs> through things that happen, situations that occur that we hadn't bargained for. And we can feel like uh, just so empty. And uh, I think so many people, especially after the pandemic and after all the stuff that happened, so many people feeling empty. And uh, a lot of people not going back out to church, sometimes because they couldn't and sometimes because they wouldn't, and left a feeling of emptiness as well. And I just want to share this morning about a, a single mum uh, with a broken heart and how God, God brought great healing. And it's 2 Kings 4, uh, the first seven verses. Uh, I'll read at the beginning anyhow. Um, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor is coming to take away my two sons as my two sons as slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, well, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and she shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Now, Elisha, as we know, uh, was, uh, he was a principal of the uh, prophetic uh, Bible schools that his predecessor Elijah had set up and he continued with that ministry where they trained young men uh, to move in the prophetic office. And he was also a son of one of the prophets and uh, the son had died. Uh, so this son was also a prophet as well and he served under Elisha. And this was a very difficult time in the nation's economy, uh, a bit like today. And uh, uh, somehow this couple found themselves having to borrow. Maybe, and many times I've thought of this, that, that maybe, just maybe, if the husband hadn't, hadn't died, maybe they could have eventually turned this thing around. We don't know that because there wasn't a chance to find that out. Uh, her husband died, and it doesn't say here whether it was a quick, sudden death, whether it was a long, slow illness, or what it was. But all we know is that she was left as a, a single mum, a widow, with two young boys in their little home, penniless and in debt. In today's world, we call that negative equity. And, uh, uh, or I suppose more today, when you put on the news, it's the cost of living crisis we hear all the time. Uh, we're bombarded with that, uh, that um, uh, little quotation. And uh, this, was, this was how she was at that time. There certainly was a cost of living crisis in her life at that time. And the loan sharks would be at the door looking for money she didn't have. 
And the, the Mosaic law, and thank God we don't live in those times, <laughs> Trevor, because the Mosaic law gave them the right to claim the person or the children of the debtor. But the debtor was dead. So there was just the two boys. And so there was a, they had a right to come and the money couldn't uh, be paid. They would take the two boys as slaves to pay off uh, their debt. So what a situation and what a mess. What did this young mother do? And that's what we want to look at this morning. What did she do? It says she cried. Uh, that's the first, and the modern translations maybe said she prayed. I don't know, but it says she cried. And, uh, you know, she had cried a lot by this time, I'm sure. Uh, tears of grief and tears of loneliness, tears of helplessness, tears of sorrow and heartache. But the thing was, it was who she cried to that made all the difference. Her cry was Godward. See, this is before Calvary, and uh, Elisha was God's man on the ground, his, um, God's ambassador for the nation of Israel at that time. So um, now we can pray wherever we are, any, anytime, anywhere. And it's amazing just uh, that many people don't even avail themselves of that wonderful privilege. But we can do that. But in those days, you had to go to where the man of God was because he was God's representative. He was the one who carried God's presence uh, up until the time of uh, Calvary. So we find here that her cry was Godward. And you see, many times we cry out of pain, maybe physical pain, maybe emotional pain, uh, spiritual pain, mental pain, circumstantial, whatever it might be, and we can seem so helpless. But I say, as long as our cry is Godward, that's the most important thing. And the night I had to fall was the very night that our uh, daughter-in-law and the two kids were coming back from Australia, emigrating here, and I was beyond excited. And I told you about it at the conference, and uh, saying tomorrow, this time tomorrow, we're heading off to Belfast to the airport to pick them up. And uh, you were, and thanks to those who prayed about the, the safe journey, the, the two massive long haul flights uh, she, she had with two little children of five and a half and, and uh, three and a half. And David's not, it's not here yet. He'll be here soon, but he couldn't come at that time. He had to sort some things out and tie some loose ends up before he would come. And uh, we were really praying much about the long haul journey and all the stuff. And there she had come. She arrived at Belfast Airport and it happened. She was here and she was in time and there were no cancellations. And we were so thankful. And before she, she wasn't well, an hour in, maybe not even half an hour in Irish soil until I felt the biggest rattle <laughs> uh, and uh, came out of the airport. It was I'm not going to tell all the details, but the result was I came home in absolute agony and I wondered would have been hospital before the morning. Now God undertook, there was no structural damage, just pulled muscles from the top of my leg to the bottom. I was black, totally black. And uh, I had just pulled muscles everywhere. I'd hurt my spine again, hurt my hip and uh, my knee. And uh, I was right back to, it seemed to almost square one. And I was lying in bed that night, you know, and I cried, I tell you. And, uh, but my cry was Godward. That's the important thing. I cried to him. And I couldn't understand it. I couldn't believe it was happening. And the way home in the car, I remember thinking, God, I can't believe this has happened. And it was agony. But I tried to cover up in front of them. And my daughter Diane was in the second car. There was two car loads of us and for cases and so on. And, and uh, I said, Lord, I did not want this to be about me. This was never meant to be about me. It was about them coming and the joy of them coming. And our other daughter, Lisa, and uh, a sister uh, was waiting uh, at home for them coming. So excited. And here was me in absolute agony, having to be oxter cogged as I say, into the house. And it turned out it was all about me, and I didn't like that at all. Uh, through the night, I didn't know just what damage or anything. I knew I could mark my foot, and I knew that was a good sign. But the pain was horrific. And I just thought, oh God, I, I don't understand you. And at times things happen, and we just have to say honestly to God, God, I don't understand you. And I said that so many times over the years, and I said it again that night. But I said, I'll just, I just love you and I'll always love you. And no matter what way things pan out, I'll always love you. But I don't understand how this had to happen, especially now they were lying next door in the, the guest bedroom and uh, everybody was sound asleep. Everything had gone so well. And I'd looked and longed and dreamt of that day and there I was lying in agony. Um, and God has come and, and undertaken and I thank God there's no structural damage in that sense. Uh, and um, I'm getting there. But I cried. But you see, it's okay to shed tears as long as the tears are Godward. Again and again over the years, whenever stuff happened uh, and I had cried to God, 
well, my tears were Godward. And we have to always make sure that we're crying to God and uh, not crying about God and about things he's doing. Just let the, 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 and it's okay to be honest with God, just to say, God, I don't understand it. Uh, but always, always, I always end up saying, but I'll always love you and I'll always serve you. I suppose I'm always afraid of a bitter spirit coming in. It's so easy. It could happen so easily when we don't understand situations. And this woman cried. The word here for cried in the Hebrew was deep anguish of soul. See, this, this little woman, she was in anguish of soul. She was desperate, but she didn't just make an appointment with the prophet and politely bring the matter to his attention. <laughs> it wasn't a very polite prayer, I'm sure, and a cry to him, but she was still grieving for her husband. She was feeling bereft and, and so alone, and then the fear of losing her home and these guys banging on her door looking for money she didn't have. And on top of that, the fear of losing her two precious boys because she knew that was the Mosaic law. She knew that could not, nobody could change that other than a miracle. And yet, and this is what I want to, to, to mention this morning, even in that terrible situation, she had a choice. You see, in life, no matter what life throws at us and many a curved ball comes our way, we all have a choice. And she had a choice and she could sit down and cry over the situation or she could go and cry to the prophet, the, the man who represented God's presence, and find the answer to her situation. And I'm so glad she did the latter, and she went to the man of God. And you see, as I say, Elisha was man's, God's man on the ground, his representative uh, for the nation. And c can I just say, you know, wh this was a mess. I mean, what a mess this, wee, this little woman was in. What a mess. Lost her, her, her life's partner, who was a man of God, who taught in the Bible school, along with her father-in-law, godly people, people who were known for their love of the Lord God, Jehovah. And yet, what a mess. What a terrible mess. And you know, can I just say, whatever our situation is today or any time, let's not say, what a mess. But let's say to God, God, will you please take this mess. It's a mess, but would you please take this mess? In what redemptive way can you use this mess? And I believe that there's a seed in every sorrow, but we need to extra extract the seed in order to get the bread. Remember the, the spies when they came back with the bad report, but yet there was just two, Caleb and Joshua, who said, yes, this, the, the, the giants are there. They're not saying anything that's not right. The, 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 the fear was there. The giants are there. And they could have had them for breakfast, tea, and supper. And yet they said, but they took the bread at the situation. He said, we're well able to overcome. So they extracted bread from the situation. And we need to do that. And I remember just saying, God, I don't know what bread's in this. And sometimes we don't always know the answers. And I says, God, I, I can't see what bread's in this situation. Me lying in bed in pain, not knowing if I'm going to be able to even to get up the next morning. But I, I just somehow, in some redemptive way, will you please use this mess? And, uh, you know, maybe one day I'll find that out. You don't always get the answer right away, as I say. But you see, uh, this grieving mama had made the right choice. She came to the man of God. And whenever she came, there were some things he told her to do that are very interesting. And uh, sometimes we, we think we, we come to God and, and just wham, bam, there we'll get the answer right away. And, and the miracle will come and everything's hunky-dory. Well, it was, certainly wasn't that with me and, and my, my uh, joints uh, that after that fall again. And it wasn't, isn't with so many of us, it's not a, an immediate thing. Sometimes it can be. But I believe sometimes there's things God tells us to do, not a formula, a strategy, that if we obey his strategy, the answer can come. And uh, here's what he said to her. First of all, he said to her, go and borrow some vessels. Well, I'm sure she thought, am I hearing things? This is about the last thing that I need to do. <laughs> the problem was, and she could have said to him, the problem is, sir, I have just too many empty vessels in my house. I have empty cupboards, I have empty containers, I have empty larder, I have empty, actually, I have empty everything. And you're saying, go borrow some more. The last thing in the wide world I need are more empty vessels. Couldn't she so easily have said that? Because it would have been true. And he says, go, well, just go borrow some more. But the great thing is that she obeyed the prophet, even she couldn't understand it. You see, I, I believe that, that God is drawn to emptiness. When the earth was without form and, and was void, was empty, the Spirit of God hovered over it and he said, let there be. 
There's something, and this sounds Irish, but there is something about nothing that moves God's hand. I believe that he at times leads us to empty places where we can lean on nothing except his provision, where the thing is totally impossible outside of God and outside of a miracle. And this is what happened with this woman today. And sometimes we need to take the emptiness and say into that space, let there be. Let there be. Let there be whatever it is that you need. Let there be sustenance. Let there be healing. Let there be strength. And just uh, talking about strength, I had, uh, we had been, um, not that, that first Sunday after the fall, uh, we weren't booked for anywhere. We kept it free because they were just arrived and we didn't want to leave them. And the next Sunday we were in Larne with Brian and, and I was speaking there and God gave me the strength to be able to, to, to minister. And then the next week we were in Dublin and the whole way up from Dublin, uh, I don't know when I ever felt such pain. It was the most painful journey the whole way up. And uh, we, I wondered and you st- said to Robert, no wonder is our long haul situations about to end. Is this the end of going away weekends? We're, we're all over the place down south at, at, at the length of Cork at times. And, and uh, I, that's the first time I ever wondered about that. And I didn't say to Robert, but I, the next weekend we were booked to go to Athlone, which is nearly a four-hour journey. And uh, it was further away than Dublin, nearly as far again. And uh, I just said, Lord, we, we will always keep the commitment we've made. So we had ready, that booking was on. And uh, I just said, Lord, this, this weekend, I want you to make it clear if it's time to pull in the reins and just do near bookings and things like that. Uh, what are you saying? Because you see, you need a word from God to start something, to, to, to obey God and, and go into a ministry, but you also need a word to stop. And we had never got that word, but I wanted it just to be, the first time I've asked for it, uh, that God would make it clear. And I knew if, if he made it clear, then one way or another, God would give the grace to stop or give the strength to, to go on. And I just didn't tell Robert that, that I'd prayed that for that particular weekend. And uh, Robert was preaching that morning in Athlone. And he was speaking in Gideon. And uh, do you remember the time when the angel of the Lord uh, spoke to Gideon, uh, what he had given his assignment, and Gideon reiterated and said, but, 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 but I can't. I'm the, the smallest tribe in Israel, and I'm the weakest clan in the tribe, and I'm the, the youngest in my father's house. There's no way I can carry this assignment out uh, because his father was an idol worshiper and was to tear down the idols. I said, There's no way I can do it. And uh, it's like God didn't even... Uh, answer him in that way. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't re- refer to the fact that he, of what Gideon said. He just said, go in the strength that, that you have, for I am with you. Just those words. Go in the strength that you have, for I am with you. And just as Robert was speaking that message, not knowing what I had prayed, God gave me my answer. And clearly, I felt such a quickening when Robert said those words, go in the strength that you have, for I am with you. And I just, in my spirit, I says, right, God, okay. I'll go in that time. I couldn't even get up from the chair. I was sitting the whole time in, in the meeting and I was prophesying from an armchair to people in, the, I says, this is the first time I've prophesied sitting down from an, an armchair. I, I'm a bit better now, but I wasn't able to then. And uh, I says, okay, God, you've given me the word. Go in the strength that you have. And he didn't even say, I will heal you. He says, I am with you. So I knew that as long as he was with me and as long as we were in the will of God, then God would give the grace. And he has done that. We've been somewhere every week since then. Last weekend, I had a, was preaching at a, a Hearts and Fire conference uh, on right Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday morning, and prophesying in between and ministering all the hours that God sends after the meetings, home on Sunday and back out to Ballymoney, Elam ladies' meeting on Monday night uh, to preach. And God's strength was there, his enabling was there. And I, I just felt as if he'd even stepped up the anointing. Uh, and, and when I was preaching, I neither had pain or ache. I would like to say that was the same when I went home, but even it wasn't. <laughs> but anyway, we still do it. And that's, that's the thing. Sometimes he leads us to these situations when we, there's nothing we can do except just fall on his mercy and totally rely on nothing else except his strength, his provision, his grace. And I felt God saying that day, but go in the strength that you have. Go in the mobility you have. Go in the limited ability you have. Just go. 
Just go and I'll be with you. And I've been doing that, as I say, ever since. There's something about just totally relying upon God. And that's what happened here in this situation. She had nothing, but the key that day was her obedience. The key was not even the, 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 what she had to do. The key was not even what the, the prophet was saying. The key was on her obedience to what he said. So that was the first thing, go gather some empty vessels. And they had to be empty. And she, I'm sure she said, well, mine are empty, all right, sir. <laughs> the second thing he said was shut the door. Now, some of us are of an age that we probably remember Larry Grayson's uh, quiz, shut that door. I certainly remember it. Uh, and uh, what he was meaning, what I believe the prophet was meaning, to shut out the negative voices, the, those external voices. Can you imagine uh, in, in the countryside then what that was like uh, for that little woman? You see, the people around about, uh, whether they served the Lord God Jehovah or whether they didn't, they, they knew the scrolls, they would have known in the synagogue uh, what was the order, and they would have known, now her husband's gone, the next thing, they'll be coming to take her boys away. Because that's, that's what happens. And they knew she hadn't any money, and they knew she had nothing left. And uh, they were waiting for the day that would happen. And I'm sure they were, the, 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 the V-neck curtains would be twitching <laughs> as the boys went out. And she sent her boys to the different houses and knocked at the door. Excuse me, madam, have you any empty vessels? Well, 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 what type of empty vessel? Doesn't matter. A vase, a container, a bucket, a barrel, whatever it is, as long as it's empty. Could we please borrow it? My mum needs it. And I'm sure they were scratching their head wondering what on earth uh, this woman has gone for her. The men in the white coats will soon be here to cut her away as she lost it completely. And uh, then they would go to the next door in the next house, knock again and ask for more empty vessels. And then the other boy would come and carry in a lot of empty vessels. And that would go on around the neighborhood. And I'm sure they were wondering what on earth has happened. This poor woman has lost the plot with all the, the pain and the anxiety and everything else. But they had to take, it says, don't gather a few, gather as many as your, your house holds. So they got all these vessels that would be big and small, they would be fine, maybe fine china, crockery, and then just the bog standard vessels that you'd wash their feet in at the door, whatever there was about at that time. And he said, but he said, shut the door. That was the important thing because they had to close out those external voices when some of them are asking, what are you doing? What in the world are you doing? You've got nothing already and now you're, you're wanting to bring more empty vessels into your home. She had to, they had to close the door so that people wouldn't stand and look and mock and, and uh, doubt all that was happening. But I believe also she had to shut the door and the internal voices. And we have found in ministry over the years, that's the hardest thing. Those internal voices when the enemy will say, you're crazy. How do you, how do you think you can do that? And this is what God has told you to do. How do you think in the world you're carrying that out? You're a couple of farmers. You've never been to Bible college. You've never even been to high school. To, to, you know, they, they do A levels, no levels. It's not that. Now it's other stuff. But, you know, we were just ordinary country people. How in the world do you think you can, you can do that? And how can you think you can lead a church, pastor a church? And, and we didn't know it. one day we'd be ministering to the world and his wife over the years. We had no idea. And it's a good job we didn't. Because when... Even in the doing of over the years, we have had to shut out those internal voices that will bring doubts. And we have all those, and this, they can be deafening sometimes. You see, the enemy doesn't like it when we're walking in obedience. But he's really afraid when we're so discouraged that we feel that we have nothing left to give. And I'm sure we've all been there at one time or another. No zeal left, no vision left, no, no fight, no, no faith and we're so empty. I remember one time years ago, and it was a time that, that uh, Grace was, was born, and uh, in the very same hospital as Lisa, our daughter, had been born all those years before, and she was in the very same uh, unit, intensive care unit, and when our daughter was born, uh, so, uh, so disabled, and uh, so many things wrong, and she was there, and they didn't expect her ever to come out alive, and here's all these years later, our granddaughters in the very same ward. And I remember walking past the corridor and I saw the terrazzo floor and it brought back memory. You know how a smell will bring back memories or uh, something you see? And I just suddenly remembered the time that Lisa was in so ill and just so helpless and so hopeless that we were told she would never even know where her parents should have to go to. A, if she made it, she would have to go to a, 
uh, an institution and be cared for the rest of her life. And it seemed, and I, all the memories come flooding back. And here is our little granddaughter. We waited for years and years to, to be grandparents. And there she was born. And it seemed like she wasn't going to make it either. And I remember walking down the corridor and I felt uh, seeing the Jurassic floor brought back the memories of the battle that raged then and, and the fight we had. And somehow I felt, you know how sometimes when you're going through stuff, you can feel so, so old. And I was walking down, I was tired. And I know that, that, that Diane, was a, she'd been a missionary for years. And now God had blessed her with a husband. And at, at 42, she had this wonderful little girl. And then there was so much wrong. And I remember walking down the corridor and saying, God, I don't think I have any fight left. I fought that battle 38 years ago or whatever it was then. I fought that battle. No, it was just 10 now. She was 33 years ago, it probably was at that time. I fought that battle over our daughter. I don't know of the strength and the fight to fight over a grandchild. I don't think we can. And just as, as we're going down to the car and just heard God say to me, even though you, have no, you feel you have no fight left, don't you go out of the fight. Even you feel the fight's out of you. And I, I remember saying, Lord, I feel the fight's out of me. The fight has clean gone out of me, as it would say in Ulster. And God says, it might have gone out of you, but don't you go out of the fight. And I said, okay, with your grace, then I'll stay in the fight. And thank God, Grace is now 10. And her last year at primary school, and just this year, she asked the Lord into her heart, at the Wondrous Conference, the children's meeting there. And um, it's just an amazing wee girl. But it seemed so difficult at the time. So, you see, even when we're at the stage where we have no fight left and no zeal left and, and just nothing left, yet we still go on walking in obedience to God and his plan and purpose for our lives. That scares the devil more than anything else in the world. Whenever everything's going well and we're praising God, the devil doesn't like it. But when everything's going not well and the opposite to well, and we're still praising God, sometimes through gritted teeth, sometimes, Trevor, we, the last thing we think we're doing, we just do it anyway. That scares the devil more than anything else. So she had to shut the door and all those voices. The third thing he said to her, pour out. He says, gather vessels, borrow vessels. And he said, secondly, shut the door. And then thirdly, he said, pour out. Out. But what's she going to pour out? <laughs> she has a whole bang jang, as we say in Ulster, of, of empty vessels, all sizes, all shapes, all sounds. And he says, Pour out. And you see, whenever he asked, What do you have in the house? She said, I have nothing. And then suddenly it was almost an afterthought. Well, well, just that wee pot of oil. She remembered the little pot of oil that was in the corner somewhere. That's all. We see, that was all God needed. That was the seed. And uh, she lifted the wee pot and I'm sure she looked at the size of it and all these vessels she was thinking to herself well that's crazy this is absolutely crazy but you see the secret was not in the size of the vessels or the amount of the vessels or the value of the vessels the secret was in the pouring and you know I remember God said to me one time when things weren't so good and he said just keep pouring out of our, our seeming nothingness as our, our eyes are Godward and we keep pouring out of here, we'll find there's a reservoir within us of love and grace and mercy that we didn't even remember existed. And this is what this little woman had to do. While she poured, the oil flowed. When she stopped pouring, the oil stopped flowing. So could I just say again, no matter what your situation is, just, just keep pouring. Keep pouring in faith to him. Because the answer, I believe, is here inside of us. The God of the universe lives inside by his spirit. The oil is there in our inner being. And many, many times when we go to minister, we feel we have nothing left to give. Stuff has happened and we have nothing left. And we can go feeling, feeling so empty. But as we start to pour and we start to, to minister... And the oil begins to, we tap into his supply and the oil comes and we realize there's more then than we realized there had been before that. So I believe as we start pouring out of our emptiness, whatever we're doing, the supernatural kicks in and we find we're tapping into a spring of his anointing that we forgot was even there. Oh, the times that over the years that Robert and I have proved that. Sometimes the pain and the, the weariness of the journey has a way of, of dulling our mind to the truth that way down deep within us, 
as this wonderful reservoir of his grace and his love and his power and his strength. You see, the oil is there. We look to the circumstances for the oil. We look around to see what can we do, what, what will happen, how can we fix this or how can we receive that. The oil is in here. We need to look to the right place. It's waiting to be tapped into. You know the old chorus we used to sing, he was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. Waiting as, as we try to fix it on our own. Waiting as we, and we finally run out of our strength and our grace and our supply and we would tap into his. That's what he's looking for this morning. Whatever your situation, uh, let's start pouring out of what's in here. And we can't afford to look to the natural. I, can't, I certainly can't afford. For when I look at the situation, it seems impossible. And there's times I think, how will I ever go? to this place, whatever church it might be. How will I ever go? How will I ever stand long enough? How will I ever minister to people? How will I ever? And I have to say, God, this is crazy. But Lord, I tap in. I choose to tap in by faith to this reservoir within. And you don't feel it until you start to minister. And as soon as I would start to minister, last weekend I started to, to preach. And as I started to preach, the, the anointing came, the oil came, and I just started to pour out and pour out. And needs were met. People were, were, were delivered. People were set free. And it was only God. And I knew that I had to go by faith because you don't feel that wonderful gush of anointing in the way to the meeting. You can feel just so empty and so tired and so stiff and so, so sore. But once we start with the Word... And I thank you, Judy, again, because the anointing came, and another level of anointing came when you started to, 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 to speak the word. And a deeper level of anointing came. The minute you started to read the word and then share that story, another anointing came to give me strength to be able to up this length. And then as I started to give the word, tap into his word, then again, the, the reservoir began to open up and I began to uh, pour out. And that's what it's about uh, today. And then lastly, number four, Sell the oil, he said. Go sell the oil. Sometimes we need to trade in the oil in that good sense as we take that little that we have and give it to him and start to use that little. He gives us the much then. Little is much when God is in it, the old hymn used to say. You see, while they kept looking at the oil, now as she kept pouring and kept pouring, I mean, they were standing there in amazement and that little, that little tiny pot never got any less. And yet they filled up every container until every single one was full. You see, they could have had their wee glory hallelujah shabadoo time right there and forgot about the outside world. And they could have had glory hallelujah, it's wonderful. But you see, while they kept looking at it, didn't do anything for them. While they kept talking about it, and I'm sure they were saying, guys, this is crazy. The boys were saying, mom, is this really happening? And, and the wonder of it. And they would touch it. And then put the hand into the jar. Well, it's definitely oil. It smells like oil. And it's like the best olive oil you could ever get in the countryside because uh, he always gives the best miraculously. And it was definitely, that, that's a great, great olive oil. It's powerful. So, but while they kept it to themselves, it wouldn't do anything to pay that debt or to keep her boys under her roof. But you see, it was time to open the door. There's a time to shut the door and shut out all the negative voices, but there's also a time to open the door and take the oil out. You see, the oil's for the marketplace. And Trevor, as an example, last night, he was taking the oil to the streets. That oil that was within him, did he feel that when he left home? I'm sure he didn't. I'm sure he felt, ah, I'm going to be a fool here. What am I going to say? And it can be very awkward. It can be embarrassing. It can be difficult. But you see, he did it. And as he started to speak to this young man he's talking about this morning, the oil was there. The words were just, oh, so kababarahandai. The words were there to speak to him, to say to him. And then he started to interact and share his story. That's what it is to take the oil out. And even in our everyday life, wherever we go, it doesn't mean you're going preaching hellfire everywhere you go, but you would just take the oil out. You carry God's presence with us and God will open every door that he needs to open. We don't have to go looking for doors and kicking doors open and, and uh, you know, make a, a, a nuisance of ourselves. It sometimes can turn people off. Just let us be. And carry the oil, and the right moment comes, we just tap into what's there and pour out and pour out and pour out and pour out. And I remember uh, just um, a lot of years ago when I was in the hairdressers, and I'd just come in, and those were the days when I was coloring my hair and I was getting my roots done, getting, getting the, 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 what you call the foils on, you'll know what I mean by that, <laughs> and, and so, will, so will Francis. But I came in the door, 
And uh, God said to me, go to the, 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 the owner and tell her that it's going to be okay. And I thought, Lord, you're joking. And I was thinking, this is my day off. <laughs> I've ministered all week. This is my day off. I love going and getting the foils in and getting a cup of coffee and, and getting, reading a wee magazine trivia just, just to switch off. But God said, go and say, I thought, oh, gosh, I can't. This is my day. And apart from that, she'll think I'm crazy. And I suddenly, I said, Lord, well, I'll, I'll wait and get my foils in. And while I'm waiting on them coloring, I, I'll, maybe do, I'll do it then. And as clearly, so sharply in my spirit, God says, go now. Go now. So I, you know how they say delayed obedience or disobedience? Well, I would have been disobedient. So I went to find where she was, and uh, she was out in the back office with her manageress. And I knocked the door, and I was thinking in the way there, I was trying to think what I could say to her, to make it sound not, not too spiritual, to make it sound a bit more ordinary and, and, and you know, just a bit easier to, and I thought, well, maybe I'll say, Lord, I say, well, it's just saying now, I was thinking about you, and maybe I was wondering, and it's clearly, it says, say what I told you to say, nothing less, nothing more. And I said, okay, God. <laughs> I went to the door, shaking, and uh, she, she said, I'd come in, and I went in, and I said, look, um, as I came in your door this morning, God told me to tell you that it's going to be okay. And I was waiting for a lot of, what are you talking about, you know, and immediately he started to cry. And her manager started to cry. And they started to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And this went on. And the tears flowed. And I said, okay, and I went out to get my, my, my things done. And I uh, sat down. And before I got the length of getting my foils in, I just got the hair washed. The news had come out. And I didn't know. They all knew the situation in the, in the salon. And the girl that was uh, taking... Um, I mean, these were young heathens, a lot of them. And she says to me, I've got goosebumps. She says, now I know that God really speaks today. And I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't find out till later what the whole thing was about. It turned out she was, um, had a partner and didn't know that he was involved in uh, paramilitaries and money lending and all that sort of stuff. And she, they had been pushing the salon for quite some time to, as, as many of them do, the businesses, especially when the, when the troubles were at their height, businesses had to give money to help in the troubles, whether, whatever side it was they were on. And uh, she was um, asked to do this. And she had to do it, and she had done it for quite a while, but she realised her, her business was going to go under. And uh, she had said, sent the message she had no money left to do it. And uh, the word came back, that unless the money comes, there's a phone call coming at 12 o'clock today, unless the money comes, whew, and they meant it, they would have carried out their, their threat. And they were terrified. And so were the, all the staff were terrified. And my appointment was 12 o'clock. See, if I'd waited to get the foils in, disobedience, delayed obedience could be disobedience. But I went in the door and it was one minute to 12, she said. They looked at the clock, and I didn't know what it was all about, and I came out and left them bawling their head off. He said, one minute to 12. You know, every time that happened, they got a phone call, and they had to give this money. The phone call never did come, never. And they're still in business. They still have their salon. They're prospering. And some months, that girl, the, the, the boss had been a backslider, and she, some months later, came back to the Lord. And one of the other girls in the salon, a Catholic girl in Fanula, and she came to me, and she said, you know, I've never done this before. But she says, you know, how did you find God this way? And I began to give her, you see, God opens the door, you just walk through it. You happen to kick it. And I gave my testimony. I says, well, when I was only six, I asked Jesus into my heart. And so on. And, so. and she says, well, come later. She says, I have a wee piece of paper here and a pen. Would you write down exactly the words you said to God that day? And it was, you know, Jesus saved me. It was just three words. And, uh, I wrote them down. And, the, and I said, well, I just asked Jesus. And I said, God, you know, just come into my heart and be with me. I said, I'm going to do that when I go home. You see, I have to leave those people with God. Some of them come to the Lord. Some of them were, you know, I mean, these were people who were just totally, as we say, rank heathens. And many of them Catholics, some of them were Protestants, but they were just as much a heathen as the others. And through that, her son then, some months later, came to the Lord and uh, her partner uh, started with her to go out to the Alpha course. So you see, I didn't know that day the difference between life and death for them. And, 
You see, the oil is for the marketplace. The oil is within us, but we just have to obey. Now, I didn't go in every month and start to preach hellfire to those people. I'd have turned them off. But the opportunities over the years, and after that, <laughs> after that, I, um, I get every time I went in, they'd all prayer requests for me. Uh, Rosemary, would you pray for this or would you pray for that? And, and here's something else I need, I need prayer for. Now, I, I would like to say they all came to Christ. I don't know where they did or not, but I just obeyed God and I just ministered to them. And I, I realized for years I was pastoring that salon and they didn't know it. And from the beginning, I didn't know it either. But that's the oil in the marketplace. And uh, I had to move a bit near home for, for my salon in the years because I couldn't drive so far. And... Uh, the, the, and the, the salon I'm in now at the moment is the same. Every time I go in, almost every time, they're asking for prayer for something. And the, the, the lady, she's asking, when you pray for so, so and so, and somebody comes in and they hear, ask, what time is me here for an appointment today? I need prayer. And that's just pastoring. That's taking the oil to the marketplace. Just being. And some of those days recently when I was praying for some of these people, I was in such agony. But I just did it. You see, I went in the strength that I had. That's what it's for. And here's what he said. We take the oil out. And then he said, pay your debts and live you and your boys on the rest. In other words, he was saying, there'll be enough left over for you and your boys to keep. The debt kept their boys there. But then what was left over kept them living. Because she didn't have uh, no social security. In those days, women didn't go out to work. She had nothing. But there was enough left over that kept them alive until the boys got to whatever age it would be to go out to work. And the three of them lived, and I'm sure they lived well, because God does something, he does it well. There was enough left over. And you see, we minister out of our overflow. And that's what God wants us to do. Find him, and, and you started off this morning talking about the stillness and the peace uh, uh, with God. And as we just be in God's presence and receive from him, then when the time comes, there's enough in there, enough left over every time. He meets our need, but there's enough left over. And that's what happens. We need to know on that day, she, she had enough and to spare. And I would love to imagine, I have a great imagination, and I'd love to imagine then she had to go to all the people she owed debt to. She would go down to the local hardware store every time they had to fix the house. There was a bill, uh, put it in tick, as he used to say. And she would go in and say, can I speak to the boss? Up to that, I'm sure she was, she was sort of trying to hide from the boss as she passed the shop. You know, if you would owe a debt somewhere, what would it be like? And uh, he would come and probably think she's going to ask for more money. Ready just to say uh, more, more tick. I'm sure he was just ready to say, well, I'm sorry, madam, you've had more than enough. The state's just full. I can't. But before he could say anything, she says, could you write out the bill for me? And he would wonder, well, it's pretty big. Okay, don't leave anything out, write it out. And as soon as he wrote it out and she saw what it was, she would start to write out, pay out whatever it was in denarii or whatever they used, pay every penny out. And he would write over that, paid in full. And she would walk out the, 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 the hardware with the, the boss's mouth wide open. She would head down to the supermarket, to the Tesco's of the day, and go to the manager again, do the same thing, and pay out every penny. Then she would go to the furniture shop. Then she would go to her, ever, wherever she had debt, she would go. And see, imagine the countryside now. He thought the men are coming in the white coats. They don't want to take the boys away. She'll never make it. And now they're in abundance. Now it looks like they're prospering, and every debt's being paid. You see, there's enough left over. I remember God saying to me one time, uh, when I was, he said, you go and minister out of what I give you. There'll be enough left over. There'll be enough anointing left over. There'll be enough money left over. There'll be enough strength left over. And God said to me, even this morning, as I was preparing that message this morning, and I was just sitting, meditating on it, and God said to me, there'll be enough strength left over for all you need. Wherever you go, however little ability you have, however little motability you have, I want to say to you, there'll be enough motability left over to do the next day. God doesn't always give enough to do the next five years. It's just the next day. And when tomorrow becomes today, then there's enough for the next day. And he says, when it comes to your next meeting, there'll be enough. Come to the next time you have to minister to someone, there'll be enough. And every time, there'll be enough left over to carry you through even that day and the next and the next. That's the God that we serve. And I love God. Enough faith, enough peace and of healing, because by his stripes we are healed. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it, and doesn't look like it. And I know, if I, when I hobble up to the pulpit now, you folks know me and you understand, but I always used to feel terribly embarrassed when I would go to a, a new place. And I would hobble up, 
And I'm sure they thought somebody they didn't know who the speaker was. I would be the last person in the room they would choose. I had to die a thousand deaths every single time. Have to, and the, my writer, as you know, is a chair with arms and a podium and floor level. That's all I require, but I require them. Else I can't do it. And every time I go anywhere for the first time, I have to, last week in Ballymoney, it's a new pastor, the, the other pastor's away, and it's a new person that's standing in at the moment. And I said to her, you know, can I have a chair with arms? And can I have a podium on floor level? And I, I, I just, every time I have to do that, and I have to die a thousand deaths to do that. But when I, I finished that, that night, and there was people I knew that were absolutely totally met by God. And I said, thank you, Lord. There was enough left over. I came home like a board, as I say. Robert took me and, and um, brought me home. And uh, yet I was home with a thankful heart. As Bill Johnson, who says, sometimes we're called to be a blessing, even when we bleed. And I think sometimes we're called to be a blessing because we bleed. <laughs> and out of that, the blessing comes when it's impossible. But I could not do naturally what I'm doing now. Uh, we couldn't. I mean, Robert's in the 80s and I'm 77. Never mind the accidents I've had. I couldn't, we couldn't do what we do now if it wasn't for God and his miraculous power. So we go, many times we go feeling empty, but out of that we start to pour and pour and there's always enough left over. Could I say to you precious people, whatever you're called to do, just keep pouring by faith and there'll be enough left over for all your needs. May God bless you. Amen.